Good afternoon, everyone. And I take this opportunity to welcome our online audience and audience seated in the room for our webinar. And this webinar is being organized by Extractives Hub and Center for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral Law and Policy. And in the series of uh, webinars that we had in past, we covered lots of interesting topics. And today is one of the most important topic facing the world is the future of uh, oil prices. So today's topic is oil price trend and projections. And our presenter today is Dr. Sean Mu, and he will take us through the presentation that he has prepared. So I'll take this opportunity to introduce him. Uh, Sean is a reader in uh, CEP MLP Dundee University. He deals in the area of energy economics. His research interests include oil and gas pricing and volatility, industrial organization of energy industry, regulation and restructuring, Chinese energy policy. Sean is well renowned in the energy sector and he has published in leading journals including Energy Inquiry, Energy Economics, Energy Journal, Energy Policy and Journal of Industrial Economics. Uh, before I uh, uh, pass on the mic to Sean, I would also like to say that Sean has recently published his book uh, which is called the economics of oil and gas and it's being published by agenda publishing house and this is the sixth book in the series which they are uh, they have published under the series which is named economics of big business and if you want to buy this book i will really encourage you because it's easy to read easy to understand even people with a minimal amount of uh, mathematical background they can uh, understand the uh, oil and gas industry through this book. So it is available in two versions. One is paperback version, which is a little cheaper. Students may be interested in this version. But if you really want to keep it for your library, then we have a hardcover version as well, and uh, which is a little costly, but you may like to have this for your library as well. So I'll take uh, this opportunity to welcome Sean, and I'll pass the mic to Sean now. All right, uh, thank you, Dilip. Uh, thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, as Dilip said, the topic here is the oil price trend uh, projections, and I will also uh, try to speak something about the implications of energy transition, the energy transition uh, from a high, also a high carbon fossil fuels to low carbon energy resources. What are the implications to the oil price? Uh, uh, thanks, Dilip, for this uh, very remar the remarks and for introduction. So uh, here is who I am. Uh, I I'm currently a reader in energy economics at the Center for Energy, Petroleum, and Mineral Law and Policy. Uh, yeah. So before I came to uh, the Center for Energy, Petroleum, and Mineral Law and Policy in Dundee. Uh, 10 years ago, I worked in California in a consulting company. And then before that, I worked in China, in China National Petroleum Corporation and uh, PetroChina. Uh, so yeah, oil has always been in my mind. OK, uh, so uh, I think the question, if we want to talk anything about the oil price trend, or any sort of outlooks, projections, it's always, it's always good to look at the history. Uh, we cannot go back to the history, but we can always uh, learn something from the history. Uh, so the history will always read them. Uh, so in this uh, slides, you will see we ha I have plotted the oil price over more than 150 years, from 1861 to uh, 2018. Uh, the reason it started from 1861 because the modern oil industry typically is considered starting from uh, 1959 uh, in the U.S. Uh, afterwards, in this uh, more than 150 years, 
uh, you see the uh, oil, how the oil price behaved. Uh, so on the bottom is the nominal price, and on the top is the real price, because this has uh, more than one and a half century. Uh, so we need to more look at the uh, real price, the nominal price will hide many of the things because of the inflation. Uh, so the no, uh, so for the real price is more comparable, uh, and oftentimes people always say, you know, the price current price is low. Now how low it is low? Uh, so here I just give you a brief idea. If we look at this from 1861 to 2018. Uh, the whole period, the average is $37, essentially. And uh, the average uh, from 1974 to 2018 is about $61 per barrel. Uh, so the reason why I separately look at this from 1974 is because uh, this is the real, uh, the error where the OPEC uh, has been on the stage and uh, take control. Before 1974, uh, the OPEC, OPEC was formed in 1960, but did not really come uh, to the stage to have a major impact on the price until 1974, the first oil embargo. So, uh, you know, the 61, so this just gives you a rough idea. The second issue I want to mention here is if you look at this real oil price graph, you will see the price has been always goes up and down, and uh, there are a lot of cycles. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons why we need to look at this and one of what I'm going to talk specifically about the oil price trend and the cycles. Uh, I'm not going to bother you too much with the model itself. Uh, some of the audience are, have a stronger economics background, uh, so uh, you are welcome to uh, read the paper that I published at the, at the Energy Journal. Uh, but uh, this, what this paper is basically what this paper is doing is to decompose the oil price into three components. One is the long run trend. This long run trend is a very long run, the long run over the 150 years. That's the long run. And uh, uh, then the second component is the long cycle. And then the third, uh, the third component is the short cycle. Now the how long is long, how short is short will be estimated from the data that the data tell us. Uh, and also we include a structural break because to accounting for uh, the change in the market structure in 1973-1974, uh, the OPEC. Uh, so this is essentially what, the, uh, briefly this is what the paper does. Uh, so what uh, the paper was published in uh, 2015, but the uh, first complete version of the paper was in 2012. But uh, over the past several years, I have been mo monitoring how the model doing with the updated price when the price is available. Uh, so the pattern still remains. Uh, the three components. The first big component is the long run trend, as you can see from the top panel. The top panel uh, is the long run trend. There is a break in 1973, 1974. Uh, this uh, is the structural break. Uh, but the top panel shows a minor, minor U-shaped uh, trend. The reason for a U-shaped trend is there is a theory behind that. The theory is uh, for many of the extractive industries, not only oil, for some other industries as well, like minerals, you could have a pattern of U-shaped. Uh, why it is U-shaped is because at the when the industry starts, uh, the uh, 
the cost is high, but as the industry matures, the technology develops, the cost of extraction will uh, go down. Uh, that's why it's decreasing and of time uh, goes, as time goes, uh, the technology will further develop, but uh, it will uh, be, uh, uh, it cannot be offset by the depletion as time goes, uh, because the easier to explore resources, easier to be exploited resources will be explored first, like in the oil, uh, for example, the earlier generations of the oil wells are all very shallow. You know, the first well was you know, that was drill, uh, drilled in uh, Pennsylvania is only 22 meters deep. Now, a lot of places is uh, 2,000 meters or 22,000 meters deep, very deep. Uh, for minerals, this uh, has also has the same pattern, but the depletion effect will dominate the uh, technology effect. It will turn, turn to uh, uh, the oil, the price, the cost will turn, turn to go up. So uh, that's why this is U-shaped. The second panel is the short cycle. The short cycle is, as you can see, is fluctuating, fluctuating. Uh, the length is about six years, which corresponds to the uh, business cycle, the real business cycle. The real business cycle is typically is driven by uh, aggregate demand. And the last panel is the long cycle. Here I estimate the average length is about 29 years, around 30 years. There are plenty of uncertainties for both these long and short cycles. And the long cycles are most important. Uh, the, oh. So the long cycles, uh, one is the length is important. The second is the magnitude are also important because these cycles will add together. The short cycles, uh, is, it will be dwarfed by the long cycles. So why? There is a long cycles. Uh, so the long cycles, uh, if we say the short cycles are driven by the real business cycles, the long cycles are primarily driven by uh, technology or the supply side. Uh, why it would be 30 years? There is no concrete theory on that. Uh, but from my observation is because this industry uh, is way uh, uh, very capital intensive, uh, and it takes a long time for a project to take place. Uh, mean why there are these uh, major cycles? These major cycles are the sort of the U-shaped cycles. Uh, so it's driven by the technology, major technology breakthroughs. Uh, so some of the technologies like the shale gas, shale oil development in the U.S. in the recent year, in the re most recent cycle. The previous ones like the development of the offshore, deep water offshore fields. And then the earlier ones, you go back to 1950s, the development of uh, the Gavar oil field in uh, Saudi Arabia. Some of this is technology, some of these are more about you know, the opening access. So it's, you know, if we just look at the industry, is the industry takes about like 10 years for a major technology to mature, you know, for exploration and development five years, another five years for uh, for exploration and then development another five years, and take about another 20 years to uh, for an oil field to deplete, to produce. So that's the sort of why it's 30 years. Once a technology breakthrough, the price could go down. And once the depletion, once it is matured, it will go to the bottom of the uh, si uh, the, or the cycle, and then it could go up uh, as depletion effect takes place. Uh, so these are more structural issues. Uh, you may also ask, how about the politics? Uh, so the political events, my way is many of the political events often coincide, if not caused by, 
the prices, the price swings. Uh, if you have read uh, the book by Daniel Yergin, UN the Second World War is caused by the desire to acquire uh, the oil by Germans. Uh, so there is certainly there is a link because you know they need to get a, a hand on the oil to uh, fill their fleet. So those are the things. And now I would also like to sneak sure. in a question. Sure. The first question that I wanted to ask is, and given uh, the current oil prices and uh, the statement made by uh, Shell CEO uh, Ban Van Warden uh, in 2017, he says that he, the Shell is setting up a mindset that oil prices would remain lower forever. But according to your paper, it might not remain lower forever, but it could stay for l lower for a longer period. So what are your views on this? All right, uh, so that's a good question. That's why I'm good, uh, taking you through this uh, presentation I've prepared. Uh, so uh, the view, I'm hopefully I will give you an answer in the next few slides, right? So uh, whether it will take for longer or take for, uh, where, whether it will be lower for hour or whether it will be lower for longer. Uh, so I hope you will get an answer in the next five minutes. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, okay, let me see. So uh, I use this model in the paper. I, we did a lot of comparisons uh, by holding the price going back to 1980 and do some out sample forecast. Uh, so this is the best model uh, from the models that are available. Uh, so the key here is to understand that there are in, the trend and the cycles are important. So uh, it's always very dangerous to forecast the oil price because the oil price is just notoriously difficult to forecast. Even I'm an eco economist and I have done a lot of research on this, it's always uh, difficult. Uh, so uh, this, uh, you know, oftentimes people say, you know, I would forecast the oil price, uh, and uh, but I don't tell you when. Or I can <laughs> tell you when, but I couldn't give you a specific figure. Uh, but in reality, we always need to, particularly for the business operations, we need to have some sort of view about the long run oil price, you know, for investment decisions. Many of the investment decisions uh, hands, hinges on the oil price assumptions. Uh, so what I'm going to do next is first I'm showing you a little bit of what my model predicts and then I'm going to uh, look at some specific issues and some uh, other forecasts and give you a view. Uh, so I, yeah, so these slides I show you a little bit on this uh, model forecast and I compared how this model forecast compared with the real. So that's actually I compared just over, uh, the first graph is uh, holding the data up to 2010 and then compared it with uh, the recent uh, up to 2019. Uh, actually the BP statistical review only has the data up to 2018, I updated to 2019. Uh, you see the two things here are important. The first, is the my forecasts are always wrong. Uh, so if you look at the red line, it certainly isn't always off to some extent. Uh, and uh, but if you look at uh, the range, uh, there is uh, w this is the one uh, standard error brand band. Uh, this one standard error range is still is not too bad. Uh, so that's what I want to see from this model. And then I did a little bit more comparisons by uh, updating the data for each year. So I'm not going through each of this. Uh, and since you are asking the question about the, what's my view on this. Uh, so the first I'm showing you is this, the, uh, what the model tells us. The model shows 
particularly in the next next couple of years, is uh, uh, is uh, there is a wide range, uh, but it could go down a little bit down compared to 2019. Nin 2019, if some of you probably remember, uh, the average is about uh, 20 and uh, no, six. 61, 60, the, in the real 2018 dollars is about 63, 60, uh, 63 dollars per barrel for Brent. Uh, so right now is about for Brent is around that price, 60 dollars over 59 from, from our 50s. Uh, so this, uh, the model focus in the next couple of years could be a little bit lower, but there is a wide range. So uh, in the, the 60s is certainly is in the range, it's not wrong. Uh, and uh, this could go up uh, after 2025. Uh, so there is a range. Now, obviously, the next question is why? What's the reason for this, right? So what I'm getting here from uh, this model shows is basically is the model. The model takes all the, you know, the sometimes the uh, people uh, discount the time series models, uh, but the time series models contains a lot of information on itself because our price itself contains a lot of information. Uh, so uh, why? Uh, then what we, to answer the why, one is to look at the data itself, but you also you need to look at some of these demand and supply fundamentals. Uh, so the demand and supply fundamentals, basically what we can look at are from two sides. Uh, simple is demand and supply. Economists do know nothing but demand and supply. Right? So the demand side, we need to look at a certain uh, factors, a number of factors. Uh, certainly there are some risks. Uh, the risk is, is one is a big risk is another recession coming from some of the developed countries, particularly from the U.S. The U.S., the economy has been in expansion for more than 10 years since 2009. Uh, but there could be some sort of running out of steam. Uh, in the next couple of years. I think this year is relatively is okay because it's, it's still it's an election year. Uh, there could be an election cycle on this. Uh, China is slowing down. Uh, the short-term effect on China is obviously there right now is a coronavirus. This coronavirus is going to affect, I think the effect will be relatively short term, first quarter, but it's already how, already has an impact on global demand for oil and for gas, because a lot of, you see a lot of this uh, transportation is cutting down, uh, and for aviation, for trucks, and China, the whole country was on hold uh, for a few weeks. So uh, there will be a demand side on this, but it's, it will be a relatively short life, I think. Uh, but overall, China is slowing down. Uh, the next issue is the supply. The supply uh, is a big supply uh, impact is still is in the US, the non-OPEC supplies. Uh, the non uh, OPEC supplies, the U.S., the, here uh, this uh, figure, this uh, slide, shows the medium-term U.S. and the Canadian oil supply. Uh, this oil supply, you can see these are the different uh, lines. Uh, these are predictions by IEA and OPEC. Uh, so, uh, and the area, they update these uh, predictions. Uh, this focus, uh, but over time has been growing, uh, but still growing. Uh, I think it will grow at some point, it will slow down, the growth rate will slow down. If you look at the graph, it's something like this, uh, so, it's, uh, so uh, the, it will grow at a diminishing rate, uh, but now it's probably going to reach a peak at around 25. 
25 or something around that. So that's on the supply side, you know, once you have a relatively lower demand and relatively higher supply, so that could be a, uh, not a very positive news for the oil price. So that uh, could be uh, one of the reasons, you know, uh, to justify uh, this uh, relatively lower price. Now here again, I coming back to this. Uh, so this is the, you know, what I focus here is uh, the model forecast is the real price in the 2018 dollars. You know, when it takes in the nominal dollars, it could be go up a little bit higher. Uh, but also again, is there is a range of uncertainties. Uh, this is so. This is the. Uh, I think yeah, this is the IEA's forecast. The, 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 you know, people don't want to call it a forecast. It's assumptions. The assumptions is going to be sixty dollars. I think it's relatively uh, too simplified, but certainly it's in the range. So I'm not too I, or I'm not too positive that uh, too optimistic that the oil price will suddenly go up so and stay long for uh, a sustained period. So that's uh, sort of uh, for the medium term. For a longer term, uh, so yes, yeah, so, so this is the IEA OPEC, uh, their uh, sort of assumptions on the uh, long-term outlook. Uh, there are a range of outlook. If you look at this, for the 2030, uh, so the IEA focus uh, depends on a lot. On, on what's the next topic about the energy uh, transition. Uh, because with respect to the energy transition, you probably have noticed there are a lot of uh, discussions, a lot of policy announcement. Uh, for example, in Europe, uh, particularly the EU has set a target of uh, meeting uh, to uh, Get to the uh, to uh, reach a carbon neutral by 2040 or 2050, uh, and uh, then the UK has recently last year passed a legislation to achieve a carbon net zero. Essentially, is also carbon neutral. So overall, the net carbon emission will be zero. So this will have a big impact on the. Or, uh, on the demand for fossil fuels, uh, for oil, but more uh, importantly for coal, and then for gas. Uh, whether the, uh, we can reach there uh, is a question. Uh, but uh, we need to be assured. Uh, I think uh, I'm sort of the view is we probably, you know, we see. Uh, countries, particularly in developed countries, particularly in Europe, uh, are speeding up on these energy transitions. Uh, so uh, again, there are various outlooks by the IEA and with the different uh, policy scenarios. So that's the sort of, uh, I think that's the next topic I'm going to briefly discuss. Uh, here is uh, these slides on these energy outlooks uh, by the different uh, organizations. The first three are the BP energy outlooks. Uh, there are EIA and then IEA. The key message from here is uh, basically two things. Uh, one is uh, for most scenarios, for most scenarios, uh, the oil and the gas will still account for 50% of the primary energy demand. Uh, in this, uh, oil, the uh, relative, the share of oil could decline, but the absolute value of the oil demand could increase. Uh, so that's for most scenarios. The gas will be expanding because gas is a low carbon. Uh, among the fossil fuels, the gas is the most, uh, the lowest, has the lowest carbon emissions. Uh, renewables are fast growing, coal is declining. Uh, there are two scenarios uh, that oil could decline. One is the sustainable development scenario uh, for uh, from the 
IEA, the, this one. Uh, and then the BP is called the rapid transition, these scenarios. Uh, but uh, so uh, there are a lot of challenges whether we can get there. Uh, so that's the uh, basic takeaway from there. Uh, the other point is the demand growth, where well, many come from the non-OECD countries, uh, is uh, uh, still uh, out of the <coughs> OECD countries, there are still um, more than one billion population still don't have much access on, to electricity. Uh, so how to get these people on this uh, electricity uh, uh, consumption is a challenge. And also the vehicle ownership in many developing countries are still very low. Uh, so this would be, uh, uh, this will be, uh, uh, why there will be a big growth from the uh, developing countries or non OECD countries. Uh, so uh, here is again because today we are talking about oil price. Uh, so here I look at uh, this oil demand outlook. Uh, so uh, for comparison purpose, because of these different uh, agencies, uh, the their starting point may be different. So for comparison, we just compare the, their relative forecast with their relative to 2018 levels. As you can see, uh, with the exception of the BP rapid transition and the IEA, one of the IEA scenarios, the sustainable development scenario, all other scenarios are uh, the oil, the absolute value of oil demand is still growing. Uh, so this will take us come back to the long-term view, I think. Okay. Uh, so the long-term view uh, for this forecast, and then uh, uh, see this is again uh, for IEA's forecast. Uh, the first one is the 2018, uh, the and then the th three other columns, uh, the. SDS is sustainable development uh, scenario. The IESTEPS is the uh, stated, uh, I think is a stated energy policy uh, scenario, and uh, the last one is the CPS is current policy scenario. The sustainable development scenario is, assumes the world will reach uh, the meet the sustainable development goals. Meaning, the climate, uh, the world temperature will be maintained at 1.5 degree uh, below 1.5 degree uh, relative uh, increase relative to the pre-industrial levels. Uh, so that's the ideal situation. Uh, the next two scenarios, the STEPS stated policy and energy policy scenario is the current stated energy policies. Uh, so the, each country has stated what they will do. Uh, so that's like what they can, can achieve. Uh, then the current policy, the last one is current policy scenarios is basically is the status quo. So all of this, uh, you know, the sustainable development scenario which predicts the oil demand will have a bigger decrease. Uh, and uh, you see the electric vehicle, the transportation demand for electricity will have a big increase. Uh, but for other scenarios, well, uh, for oil demand, although the relative, the share will be decreased, but the absolute value will be increasing. Uh, so uh, what's the world going to be look like in 2040? Who knows, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so my personal take is probably going to be somewhere between the ST, so the stated energy policy scenario and the sustainable development scenario, because the world we see, the world is taking this seriously. Uh, the one of these things is that the oil has a big advantage. This big advantage is the higher energy density. Uh, you know, uh, this higher energy density uh, is 
make it difficult to be substituted away in many use, particularly in the transportation use, particularly in the transportation use, uh, you know, particularly in the uh, vehicles, in the, uh, in the, so the cars, uh, there are there is a big growth uh, in the uh, passenger vehicles, the cars, uh, but uh, the downside is uh, there are still significant challenges ahead. The two things, major things, one is the uh, driving range. So, which relies a lot on this battery technology. The other is the charging uh, speed. How soon you can charge a, a battery? You know, it's, if it's still take you know even with the supercharger, uh, the Tesla's most advanced technology of supercharger. So uh, it takes 45 <coughs> minutes to charge. You know, it's still a bit too long and inconvenience. Uh, and there are safety concerns on that as well. Uh, the last point is also about uh, the uh, cost to driving. We did some analysis. The cost driving could reach uh, a, a, uh, a parity with oil-based vehicles, the gasoline. Uh, so if the battery price can be further reduced, uh, and we see the battery price cost has been reduced quite a lot over the last few years, uh, but uh, my sense is uh, the battery cost, you know, this is anybody's guess. Uh, the technology, there could be some sort of limitation on the battery technology, how soon is battery technology can further break through. Uh, so uh, uh, this has implications on both these two challenges for drawing range and the charging time, as well as the cost. Uh, so, uh, and but the electric vehicles offer some certain advantages. There are certain core factors, uh, you know, because electric vehicles is naturally uh, better, it's more suited if you want to have more automations, uh, like autopilot, and then you have some uh, more this sort of. Uh, entertainment, so these sort of things could be interesting. Uh, so I think uh, that's the sort of uh, view on this. Come back to, yeah, so this slide is again is the uh, energy demand for road transportation. So you see this different uh, forecast by 2040. Uh, so we can uh, verify this uh, 20 years later. Uh, so, uh, but uh, let's see. Uh, so again, come back to uh, the question about whether it will be still lower for longer or still lower for ever. Uh, my personal take is it's probably going to be uh, lower for longer for a little while. Uh, or if we think this $60 current range is low, okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, by 2040 could go up to some extent. So again, this slide, what I'm showing you is this, what the IE is forecast. And from my model, it also shows uh, picking up by uh, from 2030. Uh, so that could be, uh, so again, on my view is probably is going to be between this stated policy and the sustainable development. So somewhere there. Uh, on the positive uh, note is I think even by 2040, even by 2050, uh, there is still a role for oil and gas. Uh, you and you know, with all these low carbon initiatives, we will still you know uh, still use oil. Uh, it's, uh, it may reduce the share in transportation. It could, but there are still certain factor, uh, other sectors uh, like petrochemicals, like aviation. So all these sectors, there could be still, you know, there will be still a role. Uh, you know, UN coal, we are focusing on the coal. I mean, everybody is seeing the coal is dying, but the coal is still, will be still there. I mean, the, so uh, to end this is, uh, you know, the stone age does not end because we run out of stone, uh, so, but, we still use stone, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we are in the building, okay? So 
Uh, that's, uh, I think for now, I think I will stop here and then take some questions. That's a big question. So that's from Abu, but let's answer the first one. Okay. Um, Aish, uh, she has asked a question. Based on WEO 2019 mm -hmm. and its two most probable scenarios, status quo and stated policies, the oil price will rise more than $100 per barrel by 2040. What is the impact of peak oil if it is realized? So basically what we need to distinguish here also shown on the peak oil as proposed by Huber because we are moving away from there to peak oil demand. And yes. Probably your views yeah. on that. Yeah. So uh, I think the question, uh, the generous uh, audience or the, at least uh, in the past, when people talk about the peak oil, is the uh, attributed to Dr. Hubbard, uh, that peak oil theory that basically is uh, sort of we are running out of oil. So the oil production, the world production will peak at some day. Uh, today, there are a lot of people talk about oil demand, uh, peak oil demand. Uh, the peak oil demand in certain regions, there are probably we are seeing some of the oil demand is peaking. Uh, but if uh, I think from this question is uh, probably I see is more uh, about uh, worrying more about the real peak oil. Uh, the, go back to the uh, Harbors theory about the peak oil. Uh, it, what is the impact of peak oil if it realized, uh, if it realized the oil price could go through the roof. Uh, so it could go more than a hundred dollars. Certainly there is, it is possible. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, as an economist and we have a look at it as this peak oil and the argument for we are running out of oil, we have never been really out running out of oil. So in history, uh, there are uh, several times uh, people worry about we are running out of oil, starting from 1890s to 1920s to 1940s, and then the most recent one in 2007, 2008. Uh, so at the end, the price mechanism will work. The price mechanism will work on two sides. One is on the demand uh, side. When, if the oil price goes up, as the oil price uh, increase spikes, you will see uh, it will uh, have uh, an impact on the demand. Some people talk about the demand destruction. Uh, so that will be negatively impacting the demand. Uh, and we see this in the, from the previous uh, oil price movement, like in 1970s, 1980s, uh, the uh, more fuel efficiency technologies developed for the oil from the transportation, and then uh, oil, uh, people, the demand for other sectors has been moving away from oil, and there could be supply side. And this could stipulate uh, the. Uh, supply from oil production. So this is actually my uh, cycles, the big cycles about. The big cycles is all about this. You know, the oil price has stimulated the oil development uh, you know, from the deep water offshore oil and then to this unconventional oil. So who knows next big technology movement going to be? There will be something. Yeah. Next question is from Abu Bakr, and he has a very long question, so let me synthesize it. Yes. So he is saying that um, given that OPEC is uh, increasing its oil price, I mean, oil production uh, cut by 1 million barrels per day, and it is now from 2.7 2 million barrels to 3.7 million barrels. So that is a, a, a supply side equation, but at the same time, he's also saying the market fundamentally changing in short run because of the coronavirus. Yes. So this question I expected, as you also pointed out, has come. So what do you think about it? Like what's 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 going to be impact in short run and then medium run, given these behaviors from OPEC and uh, coronavirus uh, scenario? Uh, the short term, uh, you know, the short term is more difficult, you know. I can tell you 
uh, you know, what's the trend for the next 20 years. But <laughs> if you want me to tell you what's tomorrow uh, and give you a precise figure, it's difficult. Uh, but uh, I think, see, uh, there are two issues. One is, yes, there is the coronavirus. The coronavirus is affecting the oil demand. And that's precisely we you see the oil price has dropped over the last uh, one month or so. Uh, from, you know, initially about, say, the, uh, I look at the uh, WTI. The WTI uh, starting from the upper Fifties, uh, uh, you know. After you know, it spiked a little bit when you know the uh, Americans take down the General Soleimani, uh, and then it's gradually uh, down to now is a fifty dollars fifty-two. Uh, the brand is a fifty seven fifty something. Something. So the right current price is already taking into this coronavirus. Uh, impact in, uh, in uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, priced in this coronavirus uh, effect. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, I hope this will be recovered to some extent in the uh, when we go into the third quarter, second quarter, and third quarter. Uh, on the supply end, yes, there will be uh, some further costs. Uh, the uh, from OPEC. The big issue is uh, not only OPEC, uh, but also the OPEC plus. Uh, the OPEC plus the Russia. So last time it is difficult for OPEC plus to uh, uh, to come to an agreement. Uh, so that's the difficulty. Uh, the other thing is also outside OPEC plus there is a big. Uh, Variable is the uh, U.S. shale gas, shale oil, I and mean, tight oil, uh, precisely. Uh, the tight oil pr uh, production, you know, the tight oil is also very responsive to price. Uh, it's the supply. We used to see, you know, the oil production is very inelastic in supply. Short-term supply is very inelastic. But for the American shale tight oil, because the technology is a little different, and, it's, uh, and also because of the market structure, because it's, there are thousands of smaller producers, they are, there is no way they can come together, say, we coordinate to reduce production to push up the price. It's not possible. So that's uh, the sort of the supply side, I think, is uh, going to be uh, difficult. Uh, but uh, my view is uh, right now is already taking into account this price effect. So what, what, uh, so we, what you are saying is probably the uh, OPEC plus strategies are being countered by shale gas, uh, shale oil from Canada and uh, US. Yeah, could be, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there is another question from uh, Mr. Jalu. He's asking on peak oil demand again. In how many decades do you think we shall see peak oil demand achieved in developing nations? Uh, okay. This is a million dollar question or million pounds question. Uh, my answer is I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I think we will see the oil is uh, the demand for oil from developing countries is going to continue to grow. Uh, so uh, I don't see it will uh, peak anytime soon. Uh, the reason is, as earlier I said, uh, the vehicle ownership in developing countries are still very low. Um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> as the income grows, uh, you will see, you know, people will move uh, up the income ladder, you know, we are just to uh, Raise the living standard, uh, so we will see more uh, oil demand coming, and then uh, you will see also. Uh, there another reason is you know there uh, could be the electricity vehicles uh, from the you know this demand will take away some demand for from developed countries, uh, and also the 
change of the behavior from developed countries uh, because people be more uh, climate change uh, sensitive and then uh, you know change maybe to use more in front of the public transportation uh, but uh, it's probably more difficult for some of the developing nations because of the just the electricity access to electricity the infrastructure is very difficult so that's the uh, why I think the demand uh, is still will still grow from developing nations Sean, okay. we will take some question from within the room okay I, 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 I any um, what, yeah. you think, what is the most crucial factor in impact on the oil price in the next 10 years? What? What is the most crucial factor which will impact oil price in the next 10 years? The crucial uh, factor uh, is demand and supply. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's no one uh, factor. I think it will be. Uh, Largely, is the you know it's basically you know it's for you know economy is always about the demand and the supply. It's, you cannot uh, take in one factor in isolation. I think that's the key. Yeah. So and the price is because this price is an interaction of demand and the supply. Well, you will see this. You know, you will have to look at this from both sides, and also. The oil price will react. Uh, will I mean, the demand and supply will respond to oil price. The oil price will also have an interactive effect on the demand and supply. Yeah. So you know, the price goes. Uh, the price when the price is low, it's more difficult. Uh, it will stimulate the uh, demand for oil. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, just it's more difficult for people to switch away from oil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If uh, the price is high, it's more easier for people to switch away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we don't seem to have any more question unless, like, we have question from within the room. Uh, uh, okay. Then we would like to have closing comments from you, Sean. And if you have any closing comments or you would like to say something, some. No, thank you. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. What I yeah okay all right okay uh, yeah uh, anyone if anyone want to buy the book that uh, <laughs> uh, I think you should show them the book. yeah yeah, yeah. I think this would be so that one as well yeah so that's okay so uh, that Dilip uh, just mentioned this is the book this is the heart. Uh, cover and this is the uh, soft cover, the paperback. Uh, so this one is very, uh, the price is much reasonable in my view. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what this uh, book is about is uh, going go through the whole value chain of the oil industry. Uh, so here I can show you a little bit, but I don't think you can, anybody can see it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is too too far, uh, but it goes through the whole value chain from exploration and development to licensing about fiscal regime, and then to transportation, to refining and marketing, and then to the oil price and the OPEC. Okay, so uh, if anyone want to uh, have a copy of this, it is available from Amazon. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. And then we shall send them the slides afterwards. So. Okay. Yes. So Victoria just said we will uh, share the slides afterwards. Okay, thank you. Let's clap for Sean and and